Dr. Patrice Harris is the 174th president of the American Medical Association, first black female president of the esteemed um, organization. And she's also a psychiatrist based in Atlanta. And we're happy to say that, that she has been such an important mental health professional and medical leader um, that we've watched, you know, as journalists, we've covered her and we've interviewed her since the, um, since the dawn of her uh, term last year, but then most recently getting through this pandemic um, that has touched us so, so significantly, the black community and communities of color. So um, I just want to thank you, Dr. Harris, for your leadership and your knowledge transfer. So we look forward to hearing from you tonight um, on this particular topic and what black journals can do to support themselves and support their colleagues. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for uh, coming tonight and taking care of yourselves. I really uh, have often said over the course of my career, particularly when I was leading organizations that words matter and clarity counts. Now, I don't have to convince this particular audience of the importance of words and clarity. Uh, but I will tell you that even the, the title of this evening's event is powerful. First of all, wellness is in the title. And I think for far too long, and still in some circles, when we think about mental health, we think that mental health is synonymous with mental illness. Um, even such words, and I know that uh, you all as journalists don't use those words, but I know that um, I have heard so many times when someone would say, do you think it might be a good idea to talk with a therapist or talk to a psychiatrist? Uh, I have heard, I don't need to talk to a psychiatrist. I'm not crazy. So unfortunately, although thanks to you all and, and a lot of, of folks, uh, this is changing, although not as fast as we need it to in the black community. So maybe we can talk about that later and how we can continue to make sure that uh, the perception that you have to be ill or crazy, I'm using um, that see it in air quotes, uh, to seek help. So I think wellness is perfect. Um, and is great that is that in that title. And then the other issue is check-in because you know what that does? It routinizes, right? Service seeking and help seeking. Um, it means that you don't have to have experienced an out of the ordinary event, or you don't have to have out of the ordinary symptoms or problems to seek help. We should routinize help seeking. Uh, one of the things I'll just briefly mention, I'll probably come back to this a little earlier is uh, folks on the front line as journalists are, but physicians on the front line, we've been talking a lot about that, um, especially in emergency departments and ICU units in New York. Um, we're of course uh, faced with a new virus, um, a lot of death, standing in sometimes as surrogates for family and not having a place originally to to deal with all this. How, how do you deal with it as physicians? And I think I'll say this a little later too, as I was thinking about tonight, I was thinking about the similarities with physicians, particularly physicians on the front lines and journalists uh, covering this, but also those who are witnessing this from afar. So I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. But um, at the end of a shift, it was very important for nurses and doctors to sort of check in with one another and debrief that shift. How are you feeling? And certainly it was critical to routinize this. You can tell me this, I don't know about journalists in general, but I can tell you that as physicians and nurses and health professionals, we are often so busy taking care of others. Uh, women have this too, that we forget to take care of ourselves, right? And so again, the importance of tonight, uh, but that happens a lot in healthcare. And so routinizing that, um, in ICU, emergency department, hospitals, for everyone on the front line. Um, we won't talk about this probably as much tonight, but you know, the essential uh, workers um, who drove the bus and made sure we um, received groceries and all of the things that we need, I worry uh, that they didn't have and still don't have an outlet, right? A routine wellness outlet. So again, not the focus of tonight's call, but something I think about a lot as we get through this pandemic and think about uh, the mental health needs in general 
on the other side of this. So again, words matter um, as this group knows. So I wanna first talk about the universal and then maybe get down to some specifics, but self-care and the need for self-care is universal. And so the first thing I wanna say, and you probably heard this the last time, but it, it, it um, is uh, important to, to repeat, um, we have to give ourselves grace to feel whatever we are feeling. Uh, too often, and, and certainly in the midst of something, in the midst of covering a story, in the midst of working with patients in the hospital, um, at that very moment, uh, you might uh, not um, have the opportunity to even think about your feelings, but later uh, when you might be alone or when you might not have uh, support or when you're uh, debriefing either alone or with others, we do have to give ourselves grace, not beat ourselves up for feeling uh, however we are feeling. And I think that's important. And I will say this now in the general, and I think it's even more so in the specific when we talk about us as, as Blacks in this country, it is okay not to be okay. And let me share this with you because I've always thought it, it, I need to be authentic. I am on that journey too, right? I am a psychiatrist. I have a lot of experience in this, uh, but I still have to give myself great myself grace to not be okay. I shared about a month ago with some colleagues that you know what, I am not okay. The black people in our organization are not okay. And let's figure out what we need to do to reach out to make sure they have the support that they need. Now, I wasn't saying that I wasn't okay personally. I'm a physician. I, I have privilege in this country. Uh, not privilege that everyone has, but I do have some privilege. I have been able to work from home. I can afford takeout, right? I can afford groceries. I have a car. I have all of those things uh, that are privileged. And even among that, I have not been okay lately. Not necessarily me personally, but worried and thinking about our community. And so it is okay not to be okay. And then we have to sort of take those feelings and move those feelings in into action at some point. Uh, but we definitely need to give ourselves grace to, to feel how we feel. The other thing I want to say is we need to manage and monitor our expectations. I am not a mother, so I didn't have to worry about educating children. Or, or I'm not a parent. So I know some of you on this call are, so you're working hard first on COVID and then as we quickly, fortunately, realized the disproportionate impact on African-Americans, we had to struggle through that and tell that story. You ought to tell that story. We had to figure out how to tell that story. Um, and you're educating uh, your, your children. Um, my father does live here in Atlanta and he is a senior. He lives independently, but still I had to worry about my dad. And so many of us are in that that sandwich generation where we are caring for children and then caring for parents or as we do in our community right caring for grandmothers and aunts and uncles and so we have to certainly manage and monitor expectations and realize and I hope everyone quickly realize especially those with parents I'm a child psychiatrist so I um, had uh, a lot and still do have respect for parents, but it is impossible, I think, you all can tell me, uh, to educate children in the, the manner that they would have uh, been educated at school. And so certainly I, I loved it when the first parents said, you know what, I give up. No, nope, this is not working out well. I'm gonna do the best I can. I'm not sure we're gonna get through the lesson plans today that the teacher has set. So we certainly need to manage our expectations. Let me just talk in general a couple uh, more that are important. Um, I think you know them, but we should always repeat. We need to make sure we exercise and move. Again, I always talk about if you are not a person of privilege and you don't have a safe neighborhood to walk in, you know, put on your favorite record. For me, it's Frankie Beverly and Mays and, and dance around your house. But we do need to move. And especially when we're sitting at desk all day, um, on Zoom calls, uh, we certainly need to make sure that we get up and get some exercise. And we need to try to bring back routines um, in our lives and lives of our family members. Uh, we need to stay connected. We have been, of course, appropriately physically distancing. You may have heard me say this several times in the media. I try not to use the term social distancing. I'm sort of sorry that we um, that was the term that we started out with because we needed to physical distance 
but certainly we need to, needed to and need to still maintain that social connection. Fortunately, we do have opportunities like this. But you know what I said to some folks, and my dad is not tech savvy. Um, he doesn't have a data plan. Um, he struggled with an iPad. So, you know, sometimes we have to do what we used to do, or at least I used to do. I'm older than I think everyone on this call is pick up the phone and call people, right? And I think we um, also got into the habit of even texting rather than calling. And I hope, and I think tonight again with this Zoom call, but we should call one another more and listen and hear one another's voice um, and I and see one another. And I think, um, you know, that is, you know, there's a, there's a promise and peril of Zoom and video conferencing, but one promise and one good thing is the ability to see faces and listen to one another and hear uh, someone else's voice and occasionally have a glass of wine or cocktail uh, with your evening uh, Zoom meetings as long as your, your, your work is done. Um, you know, we need to work on sleep as, as best we can. I know my sleep has been disrupted some, but as best we can. And then call on our usual coping skills, pray, meditate, yoga, yoga, be still and quiet. I think that is important. I do that every morning. Now, at first I do that for me and I get centered. And then the next thing I do is um, review the number of people that we have lost in this country. I, I think as the leader of the American Medical Association, that was important. We talk a lot about science and data in the medical field and that is important. But you know what? There um, are families behind every one of the lives that we have lost. Um, and that goes uh, even uh, more for the um, families of those who've been recently killed uh, at the hands of police or at the hands of those who think they are the police. And so we have to make sure that we take a moment and pause. And so every moment I do, and I think about that, um, to make sure that I'm centered on the work that I have to do for the rest of the day and the stories that I have to tell. Fortunately, the media has allowed me to uh, tell some of those stories. Now, how about the next one? Take a break from the media. You guys, you know, you, you are the media. You do this every day. How do you take a break uh, from the work that you do? But that is important. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I was informed and kept up to date and knew what everyone was saying. And so I was constantly watching cable news. Uh, but at some point I needed a break. I mean, I would go to a studio and I'm cable news is on and come back from the studio, cable news is on. And after a moment, I said, you know what? You need to take a break. And so I began to, I'm a sports fan, big sports fan. And uh, I started to listen to my favorite sports talk radio. I needed to take uh, that break. Now, let me quickly get to the specific and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, Afri Black, as I said earlier, Black people are not okay with all that is going on. It started with the disproportionate impact of COVID. And then for me here in Georgia, it was Mr. Arbery. And then it was Ms. Taylor. And then it was Mr. Floyd. And the, the comment that I've heard the most often is Black people are exhausted. And I know I am exhausted. And I know many of you, we are just exhausted. And so I think, and I want to hear this in the discussion, I think Black professionals uh, have decided, many have decided, number one, uh, mothers told me they could not watch uh, the tape of Mr. Floyd. It was just too hard. Mothers talk about the stress day in and day out of racism, the trauma of racism, and knowing, uh, again, not only the these huge incidents, but that day in, those day in, day out micro insults. Um, and also the editing. I, I, I imagine that all of you in meetings, sometimes we are always editing, right? What we say and what we do. And we think about the strategic time to say one thing. I don't know about you, but I have decided to edit. I, I was going to say just a little less, a lot less. And I think this is a time for all of us as professionals to, and again, each one of us will have, um, um, individual decisions to make on this, but I'm hearing uh, uh, that uh, from a lot of folks. We have a lived experience in this, and I think that's what makes our work harder, your work harder. It's not just a story, and I'd be interested uh, in hearing how you all deal with this, because you are covering a story, but for us, for Black people, it's not just a story. Either we've experienced it ourselves or someone we know um, has experienced something. I, I will tell you just yesterday was the anniversary of the church shooting 
in South Carolina. And I am very close to someone um, who was very close. And I knew as well one of the women uh, who were um, killed, murdered. And I don't know about you, and I think this is all in what we have to deal with as, as African Americans, as Black people, professionals. Um, I remember the videotape of when they arrested uh, Dylan Roof. And if you contrast that with some of the rest, arrests that we have seen that ended in the death of Black people um, in our community, that is a gut punch, right? And what about the, you're walking, you're having a great time in a city um, and you walk by one of those statues and you read the inscription and you see that it is um, glorifying someone uh, from the Civil War and um, that is a gut punch uh, to, to who you are. So these are all the experiences on the individual level uh, that I think all African-American professionals are feeling. And I think we have to talk about it. We have to have um, venues like this. And the last thing I'll say is what Sarah said. And I alluded to this earlier. There is still stigma, particularly in the black community. And so we have to do our best uh, to make sure um, that it is okay to ask for help. So a certain level of stress and distress and these feelings are normal, but if these feelings begin to impact your ability to function, that's when it's okay to ask for professional help. And I hope that we encourage one another to do that at the appropriate time. And so I will end uh, with that. And then I look forward to uh, questions later in, in the uh, presentation.